I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I don't know where to find you. I am like, I, I <laughs> knew it today. I knew it today. Or you'll at least have part of it today. Oh, sweet. Um, nice. Uh, so, Thank you um, oh, yeah. there, I, I will mention when we get online too, but um, there is, uh, there are three, two, um, newsletter things that I get a thousand a day and you know you just have to erase them and get out of there but um, uh, there are a lot of um, um, newsletters and email groups and Facebook groups and all that kind of stuff that you can find any help you need really can for no fees at all and um, um, th this one though, they have had several lately that have been um, quilt on the machine. Learned a machine quilt, and you know, not long arm, but just regular machine. So um, I, I want to make sure to share that with you today, if I can. Except I just realized that um, <laughs> I had to leave my phone at home because my daughter's fixing it for me. <laughs> All of us who are over the age of 45, I think, probably have that issue. So, okay, let me get plugged in. And I think... Nice! Nice! Okay, yay. Um, and, and I think there will be a perfect point where I say, and there are rulers for everything. <laughs> the ones I've shown you that I have are only a smattering. Okay, let's see if we can. This. I wear... Um, I have to wear prism glasses because uh, I have a thing that gives me double vision. And, um, and the prism glasses are, are really helpful in covering that double vision until you do something like this. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, I'm going to fall. Um, okay. So, um, we ready? I think. Yeah. Um, are we set? Yeah. Are we, okay, we're good. We're live. All right. Hello and welcome. Um, today, uh, Suzanne Starrett here with Confident Stitch, and we are presenting on using angles in your quilting and um, how to do that. Rulers are uh, it come in every angle, shape, size, everything that you can possibly dream of. And I just now thought, oh shoot, I forgot a couple that I have at home. Um, but at any rate, um, so the, did you all get a handout? No, didn't, okay. Here, I'll just have you pass those around, please. And I, yep, mm-hmm, of course, thank you. Oh gosh, you can color. Hi. Here, grab a there you go. Have a seat. Sure. Wherever you can. Thank you for taking care of me. Okay. Um, so what I want to do in talking about angles is first um, as I always try to, I think, is to minimize the the fear of anything in quilting that makes you think, I can't do that. Um, because you can, it's, it just isn't, it's not that it's difficult, it's that we just need to, um, we just need to get a framework that works for us. And so each one of us has a different way of doing that. If in school you were a math whiz and loved math and loved geometry, I can't imagine you being in anything but quilters heaven while you so on angles. Um, if 
Uh, if that wasn't your thing, that's okay. Um, because angles give us something in our quilting that, and, and even squares are angles, so we still have angles when we're in squares. Um, but when we till that line, so, so anything that's parallel is this. There's the same measurement on this end as there is on this end. That's parallel. And then when you have two parallel lines and another two parallel lines, you usually have a square unless they go like this and then you have diamonds or parallelograms. Oh my gosh. So don't worry about that. Um, when, when you have anything that comes to a point and, it's, it, and it has three sides or five sides, but it's not four, then we start having to look at what that angle is and how things fit together. Um, and it's, if, if you look at a straight line, then you're at zero. And when you come up a little bit, you're at 30. And a little bit more, you're at 60. And straight up is 90 degree. In between 90 and zero is 45. So that's kind of a simple math, easy peasy. And there are some fun things that we can do if the precision of it is not our thing. And that is with wonky stuff, improv, or uh, foundation piecing and templates um, that just give us the shape to sew a chunk of fabric to. So, um, so, so there are lots of ways to get around the math of it. Um, <clears throat> so that's what an angle is. So how do you cut an angle? You either have rulers, just a regular old standard ruler. I happen to like the eight and a half inch width. It just seems like six cuts me too narrow um, more often than I, I like. So jumping up to the eight and a half is a nice, um, covers all bases pretty much. Um, this is 24 by eight and a half. And down here, uh, you see this crazy pyramid Egyptian thing going on that is a little confusing and that's okay. It, all you ever have to do is focus on one line at a time. And every line has a mark. And the reason they're at, here, I don't know if on the camera, I hope this is okay, but um, every time there's a line here and another line and it intersects here, that defines both of those lines. Because you have, you have 90 degrees is in the middle, so you have 45 here and you have 45 here. And where you're going to cut is, it is dependent on whether you're cutting this way or whether you're cutting that way. And so you're going to line, you're going to need both of those lines. Um, where 30 degrees intersects, you have two lines that are 30. Where 60 degrees intersects, you have two lines that are 60. So on most just rectangular rulers, you'll have those three angles, 30, 45, and 60. And then of course you also have 90 because anything on the edge is 90 degrees. Um, this ruler is uh, just a marvel. I also have a square, and you'll notice on my square it's quite mess messy because it has a lot of tape on it. And I cheated and made a twister ruler, and I'll talk about twisters in a little bit. But this line here and this line here are actually 90 degrees. They're perpendicular. So this angle here is the same as that angle there. That's because in a twister, what you're doing is, cut, is making a square patch quilt then you're going back to it and cutting it out off. And so when you, if you make those lines on your ruler and all you do is go exactly so many inches up and then exactly so many inches up and so many inches down and so many inches over and then connect those 
lines. So that may not be super clear, but I know you can find all that stuff like DYI, twister, ruler. Uh, and then there are, I don't know if you guys have twister rulers? No. We don't. Okay. They're kind of out of vogue. And, uh, and quite honestly, twisters have a lot of waste. So I do have some other options to think about, but I, they're fun. They're kind of magical. Um, so you can do things on your rulers where you put a piece of tape and then you mark with a permanent marker and it'll stay on that tape. So, but beware, then it's really hard <laughs> to read the lines that are already on your ruler. So you might want to get specialized rulers. Those are really nice and I do have a lot of them at home. I have the 30, oops, I almost stepped on my plug there. I have the 30 and the 60s. And so we have the, this is a Rex tool, but you guys have the, um, what is this combo called? I forget. I forget the name. Anyway, 30 and 60 degrees, and those fit together. And this then goes on the other side to make the tall star points. And I presented those before, and I don't have a block for that. Oh, maybe I do. Yes. Um, this one has that. The, it's a long star point that comes up. And so that's that 60 and 30. So when you use a template, um, you've got uh, a lot of times you'll have also cross lines so that then if you're doing a three and a half inch block um, that you need this, this angle, then the three and a half inch line is marked here and you'd put that well, at the edge, say this is fabric instead of a piece but you'd have your three and a half inch line there, cut, cut, and that piece would be for a three and a half inch block. And so, and then the matching part here. Um, so right, uh, right now, please, please take a breath if you're, if you're feeling like, eh, this is making it easier. Um, there's just a lot of information about angles and how to do them um, so that you get the quilt you like. That's not necessarily going to be precision. It's not necessarily going to be super accurate, but hopefully you'll be happy with it. And, um, and then, uh, but there's a lot of stuff that we want to at least have. Oh yeah, okay, she talked about that. We'll bring that back when we actually focus in. Um, then let's see, we want to talk about so a little review too, we talked about half square triangles in another class and we talked about stitch and flip in another class. So here's an angle and all this is is a square piece of fabric laid over the square corner of this light fabric, stitch diagonally and flip it over. So stitch and flip. And any of the terms that I'm using, if you use those as your guide terms for Pinterest search, you will find more information than you ever wanted to know. The other thing to think about though with angles is you get angles in your design. So this gives you an angle, especially as it connects to the other blocks. So you end up getting a, a diamond shape that these dark and light squares form. So when I've got it upside down, sorry. My little bear's falling off his bike. Um, so when you have, when you think about design, I'd like you to think, okay, if you're a real beginner quilter and you wanna just do um, strips, great. Sew strips together. And when, and on your pictures that I've included in the handout, and for those of you watching, they're available online. There's a table runner here, and just by putting a, a rail fence on point, which means you take the square and tilt it so it's a, more of a diamond shape, then you still have strips of fabric, 
but now they're taking a diagonal line across the design of the quilt. And depending on, as we've talked about before, your contrast in fabric, if you whoa, set up your contrast in fabric, this is that quilt not in Halloween colors. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like when you look for, for ideas on Pinterest during holidays, the majority of what you get sent to you for interest is uh, in orange and black right now. We are, we are rich in orange and black. But I saw that table runner and I went, oh my gosh, I'm jumping way too complex in angles and design because really it's just about setting. So if you tilt, you can see this is a straight line of squares of only two strips. That's all it is. And this strip pattern is alternated with this. So you have stripe, teal, stripe, teal. And that's in its line. And then you have another one that pulls on a diagonal with this light that picks up your eye. And so you get this woven look. And it's, I just, I saw that little table runner and while I'm not a Halloween black and orange gal, um, I thought, oh my gosh, that is just such a pretty design and it's as simple as you can get. Two strips, that's it. Um, uh, so, so this, I'm going to demonstrate um, using your rulers for squaring up your quilt. And um, I'll do that right here. We'll use that and that. Okay. So on, I have a long arm, as I've mentioned before. And so when you have a long arm, these... Um, points on a table runner as opposed to a blunt end, um, they can sometimes get pulled and stretched a little bit and so they may lose their lovely 90 degrees. And that's, so you have to just sort of look at it and go, okay, close enough. And so I'm going to put this, I have my diagonal line on my square and it's connecting these points that tells me I'm really in the money. If I set it and for some reason the quilt had gotten pulled a little bit and it was more off like that, that's gonna show on your table. It's gonna look not quite straight. So if you have to trim some off, do that because you want your point to line up with the center of your quilt whether it's a full-size quilt and you've got some kind of jagged edge um, on your quilt or whether it's like this with a table runner. And um, uh, I need to grab, I think I can reach it. I can. Here we go. How about that? Um, my the physical therapist from my shoulder will be thrilled. I have such range of motion. Um, okay, so I'm lining up this diagonal line to, and looking through my ruler, and I'm seeing that it's going across the intersections of the squares in my quilt. So that tells me everything's centered. This moment is when you go, oh, I hope I'm doing it right, because and there it is. Then I'm going to come to the other end, not cut through the wire. <laughs> we are offline. No. And again, I'm going to go from the, the intersections of these blocks to here. Now this side you can see got a little bit more um, swoopy. And so that's okay. We'll just, and I'm putting a lot of pressure on my ruler as I move my body. I'm really leaning into it because if I don't and I go like this, we just slipped and we're not there. And, and granted that was big enough that I hope I would have noticed, but 
Sometimes we don't. Sometimes I don't. I don't know about you guys. Whoops. Okay. And when you're cutting on a ruler, I haven't spent much time talking about this, but fingertips, not hand, is the is safest and it's the most control. If you have your hand down, just a little bit of movement of your shoulder and body shifts the ruler. If you use your fingertips, you, um, you're just, your brain tunes in more and holds everything steady. Um, uh, something else I was going to say about that. Yes, this is not a good angle for me to cut. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you. You want to have about waist-ish height, a little lower than waist, um, I think is the recommendation for ergonomics. Again, cued the term um, ergonomic quilt cutting or quilting or whatever, and you'll find all kinds of information. Okay, now those two corners are done. Now I just have, oh, I know what else it was. So when you cut, you, you want to set your blade. So now I'm gonna line this up and there's gonna be a little wiggle room. Your binding is gonna come over a quarter inch. So if as you look through your ruler, you see a little white of your padding, a little hairline white up to maybe an eighth of an inch is okay. Um, it, if, if it means that what we're doing is getting a nice straight cut, that's gonna be best. So I take my blade, I come up and I'm over, -exa I'm exaggerating this. I'm hitting the edge of my ruler and as I roll, I'm pushing against the edge of the ruler too. If I don't do that, I might get out and do a little off. Or I might angle it. And it, and it actually is hitting the ruler, but, but out at an angle. So you want your blade to hit the edge of that ruler. And I'm looking through, and I'm going up to the, the, that diagonal of these blocks, I'm lining it up and I'm getting right through there. Boom. And off that comes. Now I have to switch my quilt because I'm extremely right-handed. And um, plus it's, if you, even if you're just kind of right-handed and favor it, it is never a good idea to cut like this. <laughs> never. Um, I'm not even going to tell you that maybe I did that once and maybe I cut my leg, but at any rate, okay. Now, if you can see here, there's a little bit of white from the batting. One, I'm pulling tug on that a little bit, um, but two, when I put my binding on, it'll anchor that down. So now I've got a nice straight line. So there's, this is 90 degrees, and this is uh, whatever 90 and 45 is, because it's an open 45, not a closed 45. And, um, and then, so here's another angle that's gonna come into play for you. And you don't need to remember any numbers and you don't need to, uh, and you don't need to do any um, math, and you don't need to cut at an angle, and all you need to do is, ooh, can I ask you Val, to plug in for me? Thank you. <clears throat> If you're walking this way, please be careful of that. Okay, so how do I figure my binding? I measure the perimeter, which I did. Whatever that is, I divide it by 40 because your fabric is 42 usually, sometimes even a little more than that. And 
because you're piecing it together and you eat up a little bit on the corners, by dividing by 40, you give yourself plenty of, of space on that. So um, I needed, I can't remember now what it was. That was, let's see, this is 8, 16, and I think this is 24. So 24 twice, guess what is 48? Dang. Um, and uh, so I'm, I ended up needing, no, it's not 24. That wasn't right. It's 8 and 22 is 38. So 38 twice, because 1, 2, 3 is 38. 1, 2, 3 is the mirror of that, so it's 38 again. So it's 76. And 76 is 2 strips divided by 40 is 2, plus, or less than that, but I need 2. Now, on your fabric, you've got a selvage edge. Do not sew your selvage edge into the quilt. Trim those off, or, <clears throat> or as I'm going to demonstrate here, trim them off later, but keep those selvages out of your quilt. They have a different tension in the weave, and they will pull and tug. And then sometimes they have, uh, oh, this doesn't, sometimes your selvage has a white band or some print from the manufacturer or something, and you sure don't want a big white corner to show up. Trick though, if you've done that, hello, um, use an indelible marker of comparable value to the fabric and just kind of artistically <laughs> cover that up. And voila, you're done. Um, so it does happen. All right, so this crisscross where I've left my selvage off the edge here. Okay, does that look... Can you all see that? Okay. Um, I'm going to keep it just to my eye. I'm not measuring a thing. I'm going to keep it as square as I can. So this angle in here is 90 degrees basically, but it's just like a square. So notice if I have it wonky like that. Whoa, that's not square. But now... If you have pretty much the same amount of your strip on both little sides. The two corners you sew to when you're putting your binding together are the outside joints. Remember that. Don't go from out to in. Go do the two outside corners. Now I know this is real basic for a lot of you who are um, already masterful quilters, but it's amazing how often those little things are the things that I mess up on. What year is your singer? You know, this is a 53, I think. I think that's right. I have a number of old ones and I lose track. I'm sorry, I should have had this ready to roll and I didn't. Do um, Maybe. I hate, the only thing I don't like about the old singers is, nope, that didn't go in. And, little tip, y'all hear me mention almost in every class is lick your needle, not your thread. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The spit. Sorry to be gross, but the spit in your needle eye has a surface tension that sucks in the thread. If you only lick your thread, there we go, um, then you will, uh, if you only lick your thread, you'll just simply be expanding your thread. And it's not as happy about going in the Uh, needle eye. So, there we go. Alright. There. there we go. Alright, we're on. There we go. 
These little featherweights are just as sweet as can be, and boy, are they convenient. Okay, so back again to this. Line them up. We go from the outside And if you want to, you can draw a line uh, from that point to this point if you, if you feel you need that. But it, my, I cut my binding two and a quarter, and um, mm, that didn't work. Sorry. Okay, I don't want to. Thank you. How do you know where to make that intersection? So you take the two ends, you lay them over each other, and you just move them off of the selvage. Oh, okay. But okay. I in the big strip of things. Oh, yeah. I'll show you. Oh, okay. I'll show you some tricks to that. And I'll also tell you that if you do a good job with this, you, um, uh -huh. ah. Oh, this is frustrating. This is the most realistic. I know, this is realistic. <laughs> I know, sorry. Sorry, something isn't, something isn't working right. This is how it happens for me. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Um, my favored faff is, I'm afraid, going to the cemetery we're having a funeral for her i know it's really sad it's really sad um oh okay this might have been the problem there we go and that's it i oh, will try one more time does anybody re oh good okay let's do that it's faster sorry Thank you for hanging in with us. I know, I know, it will. It'll be just grand. Over there. Oh, and also remember on your blades when you're not using them, put the protector cover engaged. I have um, also, maybe, maybe I have dropped a blade um, that was left open and maybe I have uh, put it on my shin. <laughs> Dang, that hurt. Okay, all right, back to this. Thank you very much for having that. Stick around and make sure. Okay, we'll give, it a, we'll give it a run. Okay, so we got this. We got this, we got that. And, okay, so um, as you're setting it down, you can pin it. I hate pins. I don't use pins. I don't like them. Uh, but if you want to pin, you sure can. But double check that that little strip that's showing is a parallel straight. It's not, it's not gotten like that, or it's not gotten like that. Okay, so... We have a nice straight edge there. And, and on, a, on a nice big table machine like this, you can just see connect those two dots. It's a short distance. Now, if I've got a big quilt, I have another strip of binding. So I take my next strip and I lay it down in the very same way that that is. So I have this down here, I put the next one on top, and I sew across. Grab the next one, take the end, stack it, and go. So you chain sew all your joints for your binding. All right. Now, when I cut, I'm gonna trim that little flip off. Then I'm just going to eyeball a quarter inch. This is already sewn. I don't need to have an accurate cut. It's fine. So now I'm going to open it and finger press. 
again, some of you have heard me say this, I'm not much of a presser, so my fingernail works just fine. Um, and that's what that looks like. Now, why do we make that join at a diagonal? Because when you put your binding on and you set it here and you roll it over, if you have one straight seam, you have one, two, three, four, five, six layers of fabric on one side of your quilt. And then you have another four on the other side. So you have a lot of fabric piled up where that seam goes. You can do it that way. It doesn't, it's not gonna be somebody's eye-catching disaster. But, um, but it, once you get in the habit of doing this, it's so second nature and easy. That is, if you have your machine ready to go. Um, that this is done. And I, when I have a, several strips of binding to go on a larger quilt, um, I, just, uh, I, I just finger press as the seam approaches. That's a, I don't have it all pressed ahead of time or anything. It is uh, common for quilters to press in that position before they sew it on. I don't. Um, and the reason is, that when you've put it on your quilt and then you've rolled it and then you've rolled it you're pulling the inside edge of the fabric just a little bit more than the outside and so that seemingly perfect uh, 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 no pun really intended but that that edge right there is half but as it rolls it's going to be pulling one side more than the other and so your nice pressed edge isn't really going to be helpful and it might make it wrinkle up. So I don't. Um, that's not to say it's right or wrong. Again, quilting is your rules, not mine. Um, now, salvage, again, we don't, uh, bah, 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 bah. we don't do salvages in the quilt. So I'm lining up a nice straight edge on the fabric. I'm opening my safety blade and I'm cutting off that thicker, denser woven part of the fabric. And then that's the end I'm gonna start with. I'm just gonna fold it in half. Now your question about where these line up. So first of all, if you've done it this way, they're not gonna be all that bulky. And I've had seams end up on corners. It's not the worst thing. They're, they're, they lay flat enough, it's okay. But if you don't want them to, if you want your seam to end up somewhere on a nice straightaway, then put your seam someplace, kinda eyeball it, and kinda come around, and that's where I'm gonna need to start to get that over here. Okay, so I'm going to start somewhere around here. And I do on smaller pieces like table runners and pot holders. I've shown this before in the class. Um, I do a start like this. I fold it in the half square triangle shape. And then I take that little corner and bring it over to this little corner. And now I have a little pocket. Let me put something in there so you can see. So see how that is? Here's the end of the binding. And I'm gonna start here. So all this is angles. All this is, is about angles here in binding and borders. And that's gonna be on any quilt you make, whether you do uh, Oh, I keep trying to do the back. You start right above the pocket. And I start right above the pocket fold, right below the tip. So closer to the pocket fold. Start. What's your seam allowance? You're doing a quarter inch? Or I'm doing a quarter inch. Mm -hmm. Oh, and let me say, if I were going to do this completely by machine, I was going to finish it on, in fact, I'm going to. I'm not going to do this by hand. <laughs> um, I'm 
if I'm going to do a binding completely by machine, I'm going to sew it on this first round and I'm going to sew it on the second, the finished round on the machine. Then I'm going to um, put it on the back first. So it goes on the back if your whole process is going to be by machine. So on the back, we go around. And I just am looking ahead. I'm not pulling and tugging. Remember, you want your body to really be one with the fabric, you know, and just really zen it out and, uh, and bring it along here. Now on these 45 degree turns, I'm going to aim for a point that comes right here, right there, so that it's a quarter inch along here and a quarter inch along there. It doesn't have to be perfect, my friends. And then we turn it so, oops, that's not going to be far enough. One, two, maybe. Yeah, there we go. And now I'm going to look for the point of that batting that's, in, that's underneath the binding. I'm going to sew straight toward that. And for this cute little turn, just a 45 degree, I'm just going to lay this on there and have a little tent. So can you see right here that there's right at that point, there's just a little tent here. I'm going to fold that back and I'm going to come along here and I'm going to sew right over the pleat. Now we're getting to a 45 degree. Oops, got my walking foot is catching or something is catching. There. I just caught a thread. I turned, didn't turn clean. Okay, and when I come here, my walking foot. Oh, I don't want. My walking foot has a um, mark on the foot when it's getting to the end of the fabric, so it tells me you're at that quarter inch. But if not, just eyeball it again. Don't, don't lose sleep over it. Okay, this is the, the, this is the same thing I did on this big, on this little corner, only this is a 90 degree, so it's just gonna be a little bigger. And it actually comes all the way up. In fact, you'll see in pictures that it folds this way, then it folds straight down, And you have the very same kind of little tent here, only it's a bigger angle. So, you, so it's a bigger pleat. You sew around here. Following your 45. Oops, and I did it again. I, caught, I keep catching something when I do that. Um, the walking foot gives it more even pressure from the top and the bottom, uh, the feed dogs and the foot itself. Yeah. This. It is. If you have the option for a dual feed, I love it. It's, I don't think I do. Uh huh. So now it bothers more and it's yeah, bulky it's, and yeah. weird. So that, yeah, I really like a dual feed, but we're binding a lot of it tonight. It is. It, and again, I'm, 
I'm not pulling my binding, but I am giving it just enough tension to lay it flat. And um, <clears throat> without a walking foot on my old singers, it does tend to push uh, and, and you know push the fabric, the top fabric, a little more than the bottom fabric. And so every once in a while, you just sew over a pleat. <clears throat> it's going to be on the inside of the binding, so it doesn't really matter. Now I'm getting to this seam, okay? And I just fold it, and I make sure that I can feel that it's nice and flat. And I'm only going to do this. So do you sew your bindings by hand or by machine? Um, I do both. Uh, if it's a special project, I really like doing a binding by hand at the end. There's something very sweet and tender about, okay, it's done. And I've held it in my hands and I've, you know, done this little special uh, treatment. And pleat again. Now we're coming around the corner when she comes. She'll be binding all them quilts when she comes. Yes. I keep thinking, oh, I'll just jump ahead, but it's really not going to take that long, so I'll get around to the end. Um, I'll also just mention, I didn't bring a sample for that, but um, for this idea, but I think, oh yes. I brought a quilt last time, the um, Woolrich Animal Stripe Outdoorsy print. It was navy blue and tan. Um, it, uh, and this isn't ergonomically the right level for a sewing machine either, just so you don't emulate that at home. Um, but, you know, when we want to sew, we sew where we can. Um, it, it should, your, your hands on your machine should be right. I mean, pretty much any time you're doing any kind of pressure and leverage, a little, a little, that right off. Okay. Sorry, folks. You probably heard, sounded like I tore my clothes. Um, you, here's right angle and that's going to be the most efficient physically. But if you have just a little forward on it, then you also have nice pressure. And so um, that would be my recommendation. Yeah, so that, yeah, so that from here, your hands are pretty much at your, at your hip bones. Your elbows are at your hip bones. And again, Google or Pinterest search anything you can and uh, for ergonomic, E-R-G-O, ergonomic, um, sewing, quilting, and you'll find all kinds of pointers. There we go. Well, one of these days, I'll just come over and help you set up your new sewing machine and room and space and... Okay, now we're coming around. Here's my little pocket. And here's what I do. This fabric isn't the easiest to see, I'm sorry. Um, so here's the edge of my fabric. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut parallel to this fold here, like so, so that a tip of this fabric tucks into the pocket. So I'm gonna cut, but also so that the edge of the fabric then the edge of, of the cut will um, not get 
on the, uh, it's, um, what am I trying to say? You can't see, I'm sorry. Oh, this, it won't, it won't, it won't it get, get stuck. Out. It will, it's our, it's out of the fold. Thank you, thank you. Um, so it's short enough and long enough. And now the other trick is this little point, pull it a little bit. I think you can see that, how it's just a little eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch pulled out. And the reason for that is that that fold is bias. And if you don't do that, it flops around in the wind. If you do, so you can see there's just a little poke up there. And you just trim it right off. And now this point can tuck Oh my gosh, you'd think I'd have this figured out by now, but no. Um, okay, so here's the pocket, here's the tip, and then just kind of tuck that in, tuck that little tip right in there, and, and I can feel that it's nice and flat. And this will be a little poochy because I've cinched up this fold, but if you don't pull that just a teeny bit, then this fold is real floppy and it shows. Yeah, you need to either do it by hand or whatever. Now, I'm not going to do this here because we have more things to go over, but now I'm going to set it here and I would start stitching right on this edge and I'd use a thread that blends the binding on the top thread and whatever my back fabric mostly is. I would use a thread that matches that on my bobbin. And then So in the ditch, excuse me. Well, you're not, not really, really in the you? ditch. You're on yeah. you're yeah. on the edge like an applique kind okay. of top stitching. So you're on the top stitching okay. here, but it, the a two and a quarter inch binding isn't real ample, so it doesn't pull way out over. Um, but it, you know, but it also does give you space. And you can see as you're folding it over, if you pull it all the way over here, I can get way off, but I don't want to do that. So if I just pull it, just, you don't even pull it, you just place it. Just you set it, it right down. Nope. nope. I don't pin it. I don't clip it. <laughs> you can. Those are all tools that if your hands and your brain responds best with that kind of support and it helps you stay relaxed while you sew, use those tools. There's a lot of things out there. My sensory system is impaired the more stuff I have between my skin and my brain. So if I'm in direct contact and I'm the one manipulating and folding and holding it in place, then my brain has the best accuracy. That's me. And, uh, but that may not be, and I, and I know people who swear by those tools and they use them and are thrilled. So this is a machine, all machine binding. So you put it on the back, fold it around to the front. This is straight strips of fabric, but placed on point. So when it's on point, you, um, you'll have these tri setting triangles, and that's another thing to talk about in a minute, but um, setting triangles need to be cut slightly bigger than these squares because these were those squares, they weren't. And so it did mean that I had that little bit of batting kind of scooting out. But, um, okay, so batting and binding and how to do the how to get that 45 degrees how to uh, keep that seam out of your way how to make the corners fold how to trim your quilt all of that is in the angles of the world is quilting now this quilt also straight strips that's all it is
So this quilt, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> is six strips of fabric. Six strips of fabric. Dark light, dark light, dark light. They're sewn together in a set of the width of the fabric and then brought around to make a tube so that this seam in this corner is connected to this seam in, up here. So it's two layers. So you have six fabrics, but only three of them are showing. And you cut 45 degrees. Wherever you go to the point, you only have a teeny little piece that's sewn so it pops right out. And you open it up and you've got an opposite going on. So you have this light is where that is. And somewhere on this quilt, you'll find this in the long stripe and this in the tiny stripe. Okay. So I made sets of varying lights and, and four prints and, and mixed them up. And so that's what we got. Now, when I put the borders on, I put the light border on and then the dark border and I auditioned those on my design wall and I went, well, it works. It's just boring though. And it kind of holds still. It just, the frame of it just holds that quilt. And the quilt has a lot of liveliness to it in the blues and greens. It's very uh, energetic water and ice and you know, all that, that kind of stuff, beach glass, whatever. And so I decided to throw in these little pieces. And I just popped them in where it seemed to work. And um, it took me all day yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> because it's just, it's not in a pattern. So you're figuring it out as you go and you're measuring it as you go. And it took me the bulk of the day yesterday. I actually did a bunch of other things too, but but it did take the bulk of the day. So even though I am really glad I did that, it really saved this quilt. It, not that it was a loss, but it, it really made this quilt just so much better by putting those little angled pieces because angle takes your eye someplace. It takes your eye someplace. It takes your eye someplace. And so those angles, when they're stopped completely with a right angle border, a straight border, it's done. It's finished and your eye knows it. And so don't bother looking any further. But when you have just those little pieces, it says to your brain, oh, we're going somewhere. And then when it does get to the end, it comes back in because those little pieces bring you back. So um, now I'll show you how to do a mitered border. So these are mitered borders. It's where they're sewn together. You, you sew your borders on with extra hanging off. It's wasteful unless you actually know all the measuring. I've never had a quilt that I have been able to just measure exactly at a 45 degree, cut it and put it on a quilt and have it not look bad. So um, I always have the top border and, and like this, it looks like this. So here are my two extra pieces hanging off to the ends. And, um, and what I do then is I take the adjacent sides and put them up together. I take this little point. Oh, and when you're sewing your borders on, leave a quarter inch from the edge of the fabric. So leave, don't, don't stitch all the way to the end of the fabric. Stop at a quarter inch. So then you have this little tip floating around and it gives you more flexibility while you're doing this. So you get right to the end in the point and you pinch that. Then, just as we were looking through our ruler and finding that diagonal, I get this diagonal to this point, and I put that 
hold that, and then I lay it down here, and I get wires out of the way, and move these over, that. And I'm gonna go with the next block, too, because square is not just point on a line, it's the whole line. And so here's, okay, I'm pushing down right smack at the point here, and I'm pushing down right here, and I've got that. Now I'm going to be really gentle, because when you work with bias, you're going to end up pulling more than, I'm feeling in here for the matching seam, and so they're lined up on top of each other. I'm feeling through here for the matching seam. I'm pulling the underside fabric, just giving it a little tug to get it all lined up. I'm padding it, not pulling it and tugging it, just padding it. And from the border, I'm going perpendicular. I'm spreading it out flat. I'm spreading it out flat. And then, we take this, lay it out, and this. And I'm going to align this border, the top side, to the bottom side. Pat, pat, pat. Now, this seam that connects the whole border to the quilt I have pre-pressed it, I did use an iron, and I pre-pressed it toward the border. That may be a decision that needs to be different based on the construction of the quilt, but this has more seams, so if I can let them go flat instead of have them folded over on themselves, then there's less bulk. So I'm, most quilts you're going to press toward the border. Now, if you have a really dark fabric and a light border, then that's going to change that plan. So, the, again, rules are meant to be adjusted as needed and as works for you. So, here's this. You get it all flat because Bubbles isn't her middle name. Okay, now, then we take the ruler. And we have the lines here are at the bottom, not at the top, they're at the bottom. And I find my 45 degree line. And I set it down on the edge of the fabric. So it's right here is my 45 degree line. Well, I'm not going to cut here. Hello, I'm in the quilt. So I have to slide it up. Now, this little corner we want as flat as can be so we can see exactly where that point is where the two seams have stopped. I am lining up my quarter inch line. Quarter inch is my seam allowance. I'm lining up my quarter inch line on this fold, on this fold. Now I'm going to look down here at my 45, and we're not quite there. We lost our space, so I'm going to slide it and slide it. This is, it's time consuming. You're going to, you're going to um, move it around, and you're, it's going to take a while to get the, your brain all in gear to go, oh, do I slide it or do I rise it or do I, you know, what do I do here? But until you get a quarter inch space on the side of the folded fabric, quarter inch, then you've intersected this little spot where you've sewn the border to the quilt. And now you've come down and this tip of your ruler should be right at the edge of that fabric. And hold your breath. Now, here's the oh crap moment. So if 
you you didn't figure right and your border didn't hang over enough and you've got a little piece like this that's missing and it's more like that grab a piece of this and sew it on and trim it off to match as though it's extended it's okay so not the end of the world if that happens but now as i folded and diddled with this corner this corner is very fragile because you have a big piece of fabric with a bias cut so this is where i've used pins so see you get to hear me break all my rules all right well i should get two get the whole thing back. all right i have two pins less pins if i have to use them less pins is best so i put this pin up toward the top of the point i put this pin right um sorry right into this seam now this seam like we've done before with four patches and everything else you can see it's nesting so one side is going one way the other side is going the other <clears throat> and i'll give another word about that later I'm going to set my needle in right at that point where this seam and this seam stop. So my needle's going to go right into that little spot. There are two ways, well, there's probably a whole lot more than two, but there are two ways that a mitered border screws up. One is getting into that spot. And you want both seams flipped out from under. You come down right there. I'm notorious for having my chair be where it is, and I just reach and so, and then it's like, why didn't I move that? Okay. Now we go a quarter inch, and we're going to come to this little nested seam. And let your fingers do the talking. Make sure that your fingers are feeling that love of those two seams just nesting right in there, flat as can be. And then you, uh, you don't want to be pulling. You've got a bias edge, you've got a big bias edge. So you don't want to be pulling and tugging. You want to just gently pat it. You want to try to keep it as straight as you can. And I'm sure there's a cutter there somewhere, but I didn't know where to. And here, take the pins out. We go. And so this little spot here is where it can mess up. It's not great but it's okay and this this here the other is you haven't gotten a true 45 degree and when you set it down to iron it's like floppy and it gives you either this shape quilt or this shape quilt and so um, then you go to your iron and you press this seam open that's what I do I'm sure other people have different ways but I like to press it open that way you can tuck this in and tuck that in and press that up and everything lays nice and flat. So that's a mitered border. And like anything, the more you do, the more comfortable you'll feel with it. I avoided a mitered border like the plague when I first started quilting and then had some good instruction and figured it out and there we were. So, um, so now I have a mitered border. So then the question is, well, why do you want a mitered border? Well, it's easier to sew one strip on, one strip on, one strip, one strip, 
and you have your first layer, and then your second layer. If you're just trying to get this effect of the inner border and the outer being contained and the outer border wrapping around it, a mitered border is going to be your best bet. If, if you do it the other way, you have to sew one border on and then two borders on. When you do it mitered, you sew these two together and then they go on to this. And Kate, probably good timing for what Kate has to share. Okay. Okay. I can start talking before I iron. So I just want to. Do you want this? No, no. Oh, yeah. So, with all these talks of um, angles, whoopsie, yep. um, and it looks like Suzanne is going to talk a little bit about paper piecing and lots of strange angles. So, and Suzanne talked about um, you know, your ruler has the 30, 45, and 60 degree angles, but some shapes don't have um, 30, 45. I mean, they're just uh, some weird angle like 46.25 or something. <laughs> and um, there's this woman out there named Deb Tucker, um, and she is actually a math genius and Me. understands there are a lot of them in quilting <laughs> like all this stuff and she has created rulers that allow you to make really otherwise difficult shapes super easily and Karen you you took some classes at I Deer did, Country a boot camp. Yes, I my oh my <laughs> gosh. So, well, I'm not even I'm not even done with my I'm freshman year yet. <laughs> no, I'm not even done with freshmen. So, you're ahead of me. But I so you know, I own a fabric store. Um, but I I just like was despairing that I wouldn't ever be a great quilter because I am not that exact. And um, my quilts always turned out a little wonky. I love making clothes. You don't have to be quite as exact. Um, but then I learned about these rulers. And what Deb Tucker has you do is um, make your units slightly oversized. And then her rulers help you trim them to the precise size that you need. And so then then you're basically trimming to square, you're making squares, and then you're just sewing the squares together. And it's super easy to be accurate. Um, so kind of in between what Suzanne was just talking about with 45 degree angles and 30 degree angles and 60 degree angles and paper piecing like this is, are these um, Tucker Studio 180 design rulers and they're just great so this I, I just brought the corner beam which looks like this which is some weird angle but she has designed a ruler that tells you what size strips to start with it tells you where to how to trim the three triangles that go in the corner beam has you make it slightly oversized and has the lines you need to trim it so that it's exactly right so this is this junction is exactly a quarter inch um, and you can put together super difficult looking quilts really easily um, 
so the corner beam is a some strange angle certainly not 45 30 or 60 as is the v block so um i the v block was one of the first um, of deb tucker's rulers that i used a lot and i didn't realize that this is like a hard <coughs> unit if you don't have the ruler it's, the, it's not necessarily the same um angles but it's a similar concept is that right so um my first quilt i designed for we quilt the city i used the v block ruler and then quickly learned that if you don't use the ruler it this is a really hard block <laughs> but with the v block ruler she just makes it super easy and you can make them from side from one and a half inches up to six and a half inches with the same ruler. Has, she has you start with strips and it goes really fast. So I just wanted to talk about that. Yay. Do you have any comments, Karen? Or well, I do have a picture of one. Oh. It has not been quilted. It's still. Um, Which shapes did you use? Well, I used Oh my gosh. <laughs> and this shows the corner blocks Ooh. as a corner. Oh, blocks. yeah. So I can make this Beautiful. a little brighter. And this, again, has not been quilted. It hasn't even been pressed at this, at this picture. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so that's oh, amazing. Wow. So like all, I don't know. I, oh. These rulers <laughs> have, Precision. have blown my mind. Uh -huh. they, they really make this easy. Yeah, they really uh -huh. make it easy. And... Um, so anyway, I uh, and you can contrary to say getting a template for that block, right? You, I mean, um, Jen Kingwell's blocks that we used in right. the block of the month of year, right? With all those, those templates, actually, that's these um, that came with the, templates. Yeah, and the templates simply say make this one block with these templates, and they aren't necessarily going to interface with other templates. Right. Whereas this ruler gives you a framework to do that. Yeah. Yeah, to have more creative. Yeah, and because, yeah, so it's, you can make so many different mm -hmm. sizes. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, when you start, yeah, when you start putting these together, these are the different sizes, it, pretend they're the same size, you get really, really interesting yeah. shapes, like almost a curve because yep. it's a different angle. So um, it's really fun. For me, it's always the problem of why. And the reason from what I'm looking at why that's effective is because the seam allowance is in part of, is that yes. quarter inch that's right. at the bottom of the yes. yeah. that angle. Right. And if you're, if you're new to doing this stuff, right. you know, it all seems like magic <laughs> and with these, these rulers are a have to yeah they do make it easier but if you don't understand why the heck they work right yeah. exactly see, that's been my problem is mm -hmm. i do everything fast backwards mm. and i come at it from the wrong side right and it wasn't until you held that up that i realized oh Oh, that's that's it. why it works. <laughs> right. And she has, every ruler has right hand and left hand oh, wow. um, instructions. Oh, and yeah. Really it sho shows you how you just, all you have to do is have your shape at a right, either this way or that way for trimming. And she shows you how to do it. She's funny because she has a video for every one of her rulers and she tries to the first couple she tried to cut with her left hand just to be nice and now she's like yeah no my my life is too <laughs> precious <laughs> i'm not gonna cut my fingers off <laughs> but they totally work for right-handed or left-handed um and she also um talks a lot shows how to do other like slightly different shapes with um, yeah, the corner, yeah, there's the corner pop, the corner, anyway, um, yeah, so this, you, you, every edge is going to be like an eighth of an inch too big, and when you trim it, you're going to get this quarter inch seam allowance right there. 
and it's really easy to match them up. So. And templates will often give you that too. Like mm -hmm. there's a little hole where you make a mark, and and for instance, right. right here, this is the cut edge of the fabric, so where it sews together, it would get on that point. The template is designed to make sure that that happens too. But if you don't understand that. You might have been sewing, mm -hmm. and your point got right to the edge, and you're thinking, oh, that's where it's supposed to be. And then you sew it. It's like, wait a minute, that's a U, not a V. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> Catherine. So, yeah, like right when I started quilting, and I was doing half square triangles. Right. Like, no, 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 no. You I know. You have your trimmer. And I, I think at first I was so worried about waste, mm -hmm. but as a beginner, it's to me, it's, it's better to have to waste and just learn what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, when she builds that in, you just feel more confident, like, oh, I can, like, sew this together and then just square it up and, you know, right. if it's a little bit wonky, it doesn't matter. Right. And so I think that, like, I still, I used it this morning. You know, yeah. I use it all the yeah. So her basic yeah. tool is the Tucker trimmer, yeah. and it helps you make half square triangles, quarter square triangles, yeah. and combination units. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, whenever so someone helpful. just starting, I'm just like, yeah. you, this is yeah, not yeah. a waste of money. No. This, <laughs> no. use it all the time. yeah. Yeah, we're hearing uh, something called Tuckerize now. Oh yes, you Tuckerize <laughs> it. <laughs> You're making them a miniature. You're taking them really less. Hmm. Oh, so oh well there's, that but Tuckerizing also time. means taking the measure, you take the measurements in a quilt pattern and figure out how big Deb Tucker would cut them a little bit. She would cut it a little bit bigger mm -hmm. and then trim it down to size. Yeah. Yeah. With the Tuckerizing that I see, they made this large quilt very small. Oh, cute. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and now she, she just came out with a, a mini Tucker trimmer that you can make even smaller half square triangles with. Nice. So. Yeah. So anyway, Very if nice. if you feel like you want to make something that's not 40, 5, 60, or 30, mm -hmm. um, there you go. we've got all these rulers, and they're really fun. And they come with great instructions for right yeah. and left. I know. Her mm -hmm. instructions are amazing, and she makes a full vi a video showing how to use each of her rulers, and yeah. Yeah, I love them. Does she have like quilt examples using her rulers? So you could be like, oh, if you buy the B block, you could try. Some right. Pattern. So I do. I don't know if she. So I for all the rulers, I have these sheets oh, cool. that kind of show some. You can you know break it apart. You can see that kind of like um, something that Suzanne was showing us. Like this one. Wait, where I just saw with these are just four V blocks and then oh, yeah. four, four patches and a single square. Mm -hmm. So, oh, yeah. So I have these for all the rulers, mm -hmm. um, that I can copy off for you. Um, and also we have some of her quilt patterns. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So and the it, one you made, Karen, is a pattern. This is journeys. Yeah. So that one, I don't think we have that one, but, um, they'll say, you need the V-block ruler and the corner beam ruler for mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. quilt pattern. And then, nice. you, yeah. Yeah. Woohoo! So yeah, it's Always, You know, when we, in, in this day and age, we talk about the word technology, mm -hmm. and usually it means computerized. In quilting, it's really interesting to me that technology means still a, a mechanical process but it is not our grandmas. You know, mm -hmm. grandmas were using scissors and trusting their jittery hands to make a straight cut, and it wasn't. And and that's also the charm of older quilts, that they're wiggly. Thanks, Kate. Um, but when, uh, when our sewing now, our cuts are super straight because we're using a rotary cutter and a plexiglass ruler, and we're... Um, sewing straight lines because we have marks on our machines and all that stuff. So um, 
Couple more things. I did include in your handout some interesting pictures to just think about. To me, the thing, the thing with angles is to think about how it adds to your quilting. So it adds in a way that, as I said with those little pieces in the border, it takes your eye to a new place. And that's really the reason we have them. That, that's why we're attracted to them. That's what we do with angles. So you can do angles with straight lines of strip quilting. And there's a couple of table runners I've given you um, pictures of. There's also just a comparison. This, this quilt, this little table runner here is in angles. But the design of color goes zigzag. So you also are going to use color to get your angles. So thinking about when you make a quilt, it does work or it doesn't work. What is it that's working? So when I did this strip quilt, it's a fun quilt to make. It's faster than fast. It took me longer to do that one inner border than it did to make the whole quilt. Um, but the, um, the, it's just really fast to make. That's fun. But then when it's done, if it's not still moving you, if it's not still feeling like, oh, this is what I wanted it to be, then think about what you have going on with stops and swoops and maybe curves. That's, I think, our next class. Um, tumblers are fun. Tumblers are in one of these. Oh, this quilt right here. It's just a slight angle. And there are tumbler rulers and tumbler cry, cu cry cuts. Is that how you say it? Crickets? I don't know. Oh, Any right. the, the, the die cutting things, you can use those. I've not gone in that direction, but um, uh, and I, and, yeah, I use my, my lines on my ruler, but like Kate was saying, sometimes you want a shape that's not quite that standard 30, 60, 45. So, um, and uh, this one here, we have strip sets, and then they're treated like fabric to cut with the blue that makes a little angle on that square. Um, these are strip cuts, but they're cut in wedges. So you can pull angles in in any number of ways. This top table runner here on the other, yeah, there you go, has um, wedges. Wedges are super fun to use. And if you want to go structure, then cut them all the same. If you want to go wonky, just randomly cut skinny at one end, wide at the other, flip them to sew them together, and keep trimming and adding on. And it's just fun. So the, the things to think about are whether you're using a subtle angle or a sharp angle, whether you're using a strong or subtle um, contrast in your colors, um, whether you're looking at traditional or wonky. So those are all uh, things that will help your design. I took a class from Heidi Zielinski, and this, I think, is a, a fun example of what I'm talking about with angles. So ev most everything in this is parallel or it not parallel is horizontal or vertical until I put this in. And that made all the difference. So, um, you know, it, 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 she was the one who suggested it and it was like, oh, yes, of course that works. So, think about that when you're making quilts and like I say they're working or they're not working. This just a fun little aside don't forget that other people get frustrated with quilting too and you might have their treasures. I bought this at the senior center and it was somebody's blocks that they never finished and this is a pattern I've used actually I made my daughter's wedding quilt out of it and it's uh, Judy Niemeyer's um, 4th of July. Judy Niemeyer, if you like points and angles and paper piecing, because those three are necessary, um, there isn't a pattern she's made that doesn't have a whole bunch of all of those. And this is paper pieced. So paper piecing means that it's going to 
have th this exact design printed on a piece of paper and then one by one it's numerically ordered so you start on one side and you move your way across sewing the pieces that's also another topic of conversation so paper piecing is its own subject of learning but um, you can uh, but keep your eyes out for somebody else's frustrations um, I have a couple more quilts just to show for get your excitement juices going this is a paper pieced um, design it looks like holy buckets I don't think I'd ever want to do that it's really not hard at all because every so every snowflake has over 120 pieces but so here's here's a wedge and you chain sew you sew number one piece on you sew number two piece on to all six of them you sew number three piece on and so on and so you just build on these pieces of paper and then you sew the wedges together so if if you're not familiar with paper piecing I know it is daunting but um, again a good teacher and and I reference my dear friend Jackie Reimers and she um, taught me feathered stars and she taught me paper piecing and I'm so glad because both of them are just some of the most beautiful things you can make but um, so the funny story about this, I made this quilt and donated it to the ski association because our kids were ski racing. And um, I donated it to them for the auction. And my husband went to the auction and I was sick. And he said, <laughs> it didn't go for enough, so I bought it. And I'm like, what? No, I, I could have made another one for us. <laughs> so it's ours. And I, I think he just... I think he just really liked it, so he wasn't willing to part with it. Um, so that's paper piecing. This is a piece that my friend made, and a little plug for the Jeanette Rankin Peace Center store. Um, this hanger, oh my gosh, is it fun. There, it, this comes out like so, and you, you know, just thread your, they come in all kinds of sizes. Um, and so it's great for a wall hanging. Um, and I think the curve and the Asian sort of feel is good for this. But these, these are strips. That, and I, my friends sewed the strips together and I assembled the quilt. And um, so she, I think she started with like six or eight at a time. And she just had those strips, and then they were all in those sets, and then they're cut. we well, using your look through the ruler technique, you cut them at 45 degrees. And so you end up with a diamond shape sewn to a, the opposite direction. Yeah, and it's just a herringbone, right. But isn't it, and I just have it hanging on my wall. It's really pretty. I like it. And, uh, and then... This is a Judy Niemeyer, and I was hoping I'd have it all bound and done, but I didn't. So this one is bound to the front by machine, and then I will um, put it around the back by hand. So um, this is Judy Niemeyer's pattern. I took a class with Vita Anderson, and she's a wonderful Judy Niemeyer teacher. She's, she's been certified and all that stuff. She's great. And... Um, my goal was to use fabric from my stash, and I learned a lot. This, this, <laughs> I don't know that I'd go with this color scheme next time, but I love all the fabrics. But um, I don't know. It's fun. It's fun. I like I like the contrast and the pattern. I have the pattern with me just so you can see what those patterns involve. So you have all these pieces of paper for cutting fabric, and then you have the pattern for sewing them. Her instructions are humongous. So you have you have all these little sections, and then this section, and yeah, it's it's a little overwhelming. I admit, I admit, it's it's a bit overwhelming. But 
Oh, man, did they, are they amazing quilts? Um, any questions about, yes? Okay, when you are finishing the binding by hand, mm -hmm. what stitch are you using? Uh, uh, mine? Up and down. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that is a funny question because I would call it a whip stitch, okay. which, but uh, I've had, I mean, I've sat with many women binding quilts or working on a big quilt together and binding and looked at their stitch and gone, How, what are you doing? How do you do that? So anything where your needle can take the thread into a hidden space and come up for air for only a brief view is going to be your best binding okay. stitch. So mine tends to take the meat of it into the quilt and catch just the fold of the binding and pull up and then come straight down and catch the meat of the quilt and then come up through the fold. So that's how I do mine. But I have a friend who does it where she pokes it into the fold, runs it along the fold and pulls it out and then comes into the quilt. And it, it I mean, it's staying near invisible. But I don't have, I don't, I'm not patient. <laughs> I, as our family has discovered over the years, we all have our own version of hyperactivity and attention deficit issues. <laughs> and you have to find the things that work for you. And so that's how I do mine. Perfect. But good question, yeah. I'm interested in scale. In oh. Of, uh, fabric. Choices. Yes. Um, balancing, you know, large scale and small scale. Mm -hmm. and what reads is solid. Yes. Go ahead. Keep keep no, going. No, I was just going to use this as an example. Using large scale is my. Oh, I love small large scale. scale. Yeah, so yeah. I get that it reads solid. Yeah. For me, without the waste, that's the hard oh, part. Oh yeah. Thank you. Good to see you. And I'll get you that machine quilting stuff. Oh. Yeah, I'll, I'll get you that link. Okay. I'll send it to you. you. Okay. So I have a compulsion not to waste. Yeah, I hear you. I, I definitely hear you on that one. I, I have a hard time with um, any of that. But I have gotten a little more free in my um, attitude about it only because I'm nearing the point in my life where I can't possibly use all the fabric I have <laughs> and so so you know use it or save it mm. Mm. no um, yes or teach it to in Kingwell class and bring it all to the group um, so one of the things that to me doesn't work as I'd hoped. I'm happy with it, but it's not quite what I'd hoped. Is this pattern is more geometric and um, with it being white background, the colors are more modern too. And this is not. And then this, these purples are all dark enough that they don't read a particular vintage or something and the batiks. And I think if I had used a more blendy light, that that would have been a better <clears throat> choice. I think it competes a little more than I wanted it to. But I like it. I'm, I'm fine with it. I'm yeah, not saying. Uh, but I, that's what I'm saying, though, about quilting. If what we do is look at it and critique it, oh, I'm so bad at choosing colors. Oh, I'm so whatever. But your big print question what I have found with big print is to be daring and just start, is just use it like you would little stuff, like you would. And one thing that happens in a big print is it gives more scrappy feel when it's cut into small pieces because you have the little of that red rose and a little of that white daisy and you have, you know, all that cut in. But, um, but how to accentuate the big print? Well, one way is to cut great big old pieces. Kay Facets got famous on that. And, um, I, you know, I, I think a lot of it is daring to waste, really. 
because I've seen so many quilts at quilt shows, and that's another, I, you probably do this too, is it, when I have something in my mind on, I need to find a better way to do that pattern, or I need to find a better way to use that fabric, is then when I go to a quilt show, I take a close-up pictures and everything. I'm not that advanced. Oh. I'm a rank beginner. Okay. Well, but going to um, quilt sh shops, or even and even here, they have wonderful patterns that people have made for us to view. There's one that I particularly love, and it did have a big print in it. With the other is balancing big print with solids or reed solids. Yeah, and and these these prints here are prints. They're all prints, but they read solid so you know you if you oh and another color thing I this is a little metallic and metallic reads uh, white basically because of the reflected light and when I tried any of these other purples it was too dark and when I put this on it it was it was just okay. right okay. yeah so sometimes there are little things like that with prints and patterns that you just um, Prolific sewing is our best way to learn. It really is. Sometimes just asking someone at a fabric shop because Vicky. Yep, Vicky's pull amazing. Things She'll out. pull. And I, yeah, and and here, I, I mean, Confidence Stitch folks well, are. I mean, they have their their samples in the store are so sophisticated yep. they have such wonderful um, blends of color yeah. and they're and most of the time not always but most of the time they're on the easier side of construction which I'm all about that I'm just having a hard time trying to go back in and use up what I have for right the, this stri stripe this strip quilt the diamond the blue green one that is great in a big print. It really is. And you can cut those strips any size you want. Those are two and a half, but. Um, you know, our first video, and I think it's on the YouTube, it, it's in there. I, I don't think it's the um, tome of uh, color use, but, um, but it's, it's got some good pointers okay. in it. Um, talking about contrast and talking about it's on their YouTube on Confidence Stitch YouTube um, uh, yeah if you go to YouTube and do the Confidence Stitch um, liberated quilting one it's the first one mm -hmm. it is You know, it, it yeah. was, it, yes, and it was a conflict even in setting up this class, which we may revise at the turn of the year even, but um, it is, is it better to do topics in quilting so that we get everybody thinking about, oh, I could do that and I could do that, or is it better to say, here's how you make this quilt, yeah, yeah. And, um, and, and make make a quilt, make a design, and have it there for somebody to go, okay, I'm ready, I'm gonna go and do that. Do yeah, we're, series. yeah, yeah, we're yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love it, it energizes me, I'm not kidding, I go home and sew after I've done this class, oh. I do. I'm just like, oh, I've gotta, and now I have more UFOs than anybody ever <laughs> thought possible because I love doing the class and all month long I'll be going, oh, I better make that block. Oh, I better make that block. Oh, I better bring that in. And, and that's another, that's honestly, it's just be brave, be bold, go. I and so hard. I know. It's so hard. Just start bad. Just start bad. Know, you should hard. see my first quilt I made. Oh, my God.